Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Pete Davis, 1L. Uh, for students like us, the pre-professional rat race has a certain gravitational pull, diverting our focus from the structural to the trivial, blurring our sense of right and wrong, caging our moral imagination, and diminishing our belief in our own civic power. Fortunately, there is hope. If we build up a sense of systemic justice and a knowledge of today's injustices, then we can inoculate ourselves from this pull, liberating our civic powers to take an alternative path of serving the public interest. We are blessed that certain law students in history have taken this alternative path. If this Harvard Law student with us here today had not taken this more visionary path, we would never have had the Freedom of Information Act or the Clean Air and Water Acts. If this Harvard Law student with us here today had not taken this more transformative path, we would have smoking on airplanes and the word whistleblower would not have a popular use. If this Harvard Law student had not taken the more just path, we wouldn't have the Occupational Health and Safety Administration, nor the seatbelts and airbags that have saved millions of American lives. In an effort to begin our own, here in the audience, everyone here today, path towards similar transformative legal vocations, we present the founder of the modern consumer movement, the original Nader Raider, the one-time host of Saturday Night Live, the only man to convince Sesame Street to have a song sung about consumer advocacy, America's chief public citizen and a hero of mine, Mr. Ralph Nader. Thank you. Thank you. Do I have to hold it? Thank you very much, uh, Pete and Michael, and everybody at the record who made this happen, and the dean of students who, uh, that uh, facilitated it. And thank you all uh, for coming. I just want to recognize one person here in the audience, Jason Atkins, who graduated here in the same class that Barack Obama, and he's the chair of Public Citizen, which uh, has a good litigation group, and Congress Watch, and has made a lot of uh, changes. I suppose uh, I should start by saying it's a lot easier than we think to turn this country around in many important redirections. Because we grow up corporate, we grow up looking at the world uh, through thousands of ads, and uh, we grow up with that kind of vision. And early on, we think that it's really pretty impossible to take on the giants, uh, and uh, so why not join them? And uh, Harvard Law School obliges. Uh, with that, 85% uh, or so of the graduates go into commercial practice of various kinds. Uh, the rest either go into government uh, employees or become government employees or they go to legal services, which unfortunately has not been expanding very much. Legal services for the poor, by the way, was conceived by two law students at Yale Law School, husband-wife team, Edgar and Jean Kahn, they wrote it in the Yale Law Journal. Uh, this is in the 60s. They then went to Washington and developed a, a very effective lobbying effort, including changing the mind of the American Bar Association, and got the bill through. And year after year, 4,000 legal services lawyers were able to at least minister uh, to a good portion of the people uh, in need of legal services. Now, we, we are part of a profession, by the way, uh, that uh, is rather unique. Most people in this country can't afford us. 80% uh, or so of the lawyers represent 20% of the people and uh, the, the corporations, of course. And that's probably a conservative uh, misdeployment and now estimate of where a million lawyers are licensed to practice law around the country. I remember, it might have been right here, when I was at 1L, uh, we listened to Dean Erwin Griswold orient us, and the first thing he said to us was, you are now members of the legal profession. We sort of looked at each other, we hadn't even cracked the book, and we're members of the legal profession. Uh, he didn't elaborate what that meant, uh, but then he went on to his famous phrase that he gave to every 1L uh, class. He said, at the Harvard Law School, there are no glee clubs. And we all know what, knew what that meant, in other words, total immersion uh, in the work. Uh, a few weeks later, we were, we were in uh, Austin Hall, and the head, uh, the head of the University of Chicago, Robert Hutchins, came to speak to us. 
He was, uh, I think, dean of Yale Law School when he was 29, before he went to the University of Chicago. A very irreverent uh, political, legal philosopher and agitator. He got rid of the football team at the University of Chicago right away. Uh, and I remember, uh, the thing I remember that speech was he said, what is the purpose of the Harvard Law School? And we, we didn't even know what he was talking about. Uh, we were all worried about you know, the morass of property tort contract procedure. And we never discussed that question throughout our three years uh, at the law school. And, and that's what I want to touch on now. And I want this uh, to at least spark uh, some extensive deliberations later uh, in, in the coming days. And the, the record is, gonna, is putting out a book of some of the major articles in, in, in the record in the last 16, 18 months that I think uh, will provide uh, material that you don't uh, get exposed to in your law school classes. It's very hard to get out of the cocoon uh, of law school classes. Uh, when I was at the law school, there was sort of just, you, you'd be in Harkness, uh, you know, the, the dorms, and you'd go eat at Harkness Commons, and you'd go to Langdell Hall, and uh, going to Harvard Square is like a trip abroad. I mean, it was, <laughs> it was really extremely, parochial, uh, they call it silos now. Uh, but the law school knew what it was doing. It was a, it was a very powerful acculturation force. Uh, it wanted us to become sharp by becoming narrow. They didn't quite put it that way. That's, that's the way it turned out. And they wanted us to have our own pantheon of heroes, which were mostly judges. They weren't uh, advocacy lawyers for the poor and the deprived, etc. So as a result, we went through three years almost completely tone deaf by your standards today. Almost completely tone deaf. And I just want to uh, illustrate some examples. You wouldn't even believe it, but it's true. First of all, I kept asking professors after class questions that I suppose irritated them. Uh, we'd go to these classes and be Socratic method, and that was a game only one can play, as you know. <laughs> So I would put some questions, and a lot of things ap appeared bizarre to me. I had taken an anthropology course at Princeton, so I was able to step back a bit and look at this tribe and its rituals. Uh, and the first question I asked is, why aren't there many women here? Why are there so few? And uh, Harvard uh, allowed women here uh, in 1950. That was the first women were allowed here. And in our class, there were 15. And they were unfortunately made to feel quite uncomfortable, as you might imagine. And the answer coming back, now mind you, these are professors who are the best and the brightest. If you had any doubt about it, all you had to do was ask them. <laughs> and watch, watch the way very smart people can engage in self-deception uh, and uh, with bad consequences. The rationale for not having many women is that a seat of the Harvard Law School is valuable. It's meant to be filled by people who practice law. Women who graduate are likely to get married and have children, and they're not going to practice law. Why waste seats? That was the conventional uh, explanation. When the question was, well, why are there so, fr so fr few uh, blacks, they were called Negroes then. There were three, I think, in our class, maybe. Uh, the conventional response by the best and the brightest, why we admit all qualified Negroes, we don't discriminate against Negroes, and all qualified Negroes meant getting a high LSAT score, which was a clear class-based biased system if you come from very poor areas uh, and have been deprived in a variety of ways uh, in, in, our, in our country. So, what we need to do, and I've got to develop some predicates here, uh, because, and this was true of our year as well as yours, you're not very factually prepared to enter law school. That's why you're very vulnerable to the ideological uh, underpinnings of law school education, uh, its content, and where it stops, uh, and where it starts. Uh, you're not very factually prepared because like everybody else, we grow up corporate. We look at the world from the ads and the kiddie shows. I mean, from A to Z, we are surrounded uh, by uh, corporate 
environment, and we look at the uh, look at the world through advertisements and products and jingles and so forth, and we don't get much counter uh, counter evaluation of corporate power in high school, obviously, or in college. Uh, when I was at, here at the law school, there were no courses on corporate crime. Believe me, there was corporate crime in those <laughs> days. Uh, and to the extent that they even mentioned it, it was called white collar crime. You know, a teller cheating a bank, but not the banks cheating millions of people. Uh, so the, the curriculum was a reflection of the job market. The job market, in terms of prestige and money at that time, and the top, uh, the top salary was $7,500, uh, but the tuition was only $1,000 a year. The, the, the curriculum reflected the job market. Therefore, you had a lot of commercial laws, uh, different variations, and you didn't have poverty law. You didn't have women's rights law. You didn't have minority civil rights. You, you didn't have, we had a course on, on estate planning, but the estate was very rich estate, and uh, we had no courses on environmental uh, planning. Uh, we could learn about collapsible corporations, a rather arcane aspect of corporate law, but nothing about collapsing tenements. Uh, and it, so it, the oscillation was quite clear. We had a course called Creditor's Rights, not Debtor's Remedies. <laughs> we had a course called Landlord-Tenant. We kept waiting to get to the tenant <laughs> because Harvard Law School graduates were designed to represent ten, uh, landlords, not tenants, creditors not de uh, de debtors. And uh, this was never really very widely uh, discussed. But one of the ways they acculturated us was through jokes, you know. Not jokes against lawyers, just in-house law school jokes. And I remember hearing one professor saying, at Harvard Law School, in the morning, we distort the law of contracts, and in the afternoon, we contract the law of torts, and we were all supposed to chuckle accordingly. <laughs> now, little did we know that 50 years later, that's exactly what's been happening. That what we were told were the two pillars of our legal system, contracts and torts, were being shriveled. That people are being denied contractual freedom by fine print contracts, what Senator Elizabeth Warren has called mice print full of tricks and traps, and that's 99% of all the contracts we'll ever sign or click on, and that the law of wrongful injury has been severely compromised by what is grotesquely called the corporate insurance tort reform movement. Tort reform, meaning taking away people's rights, caps on damages, all kinds of obstructions uh, to make the fraction of people the fraction, less than 10% of the people who are wrongfully injured who ever get a lawyer or go to a lawyer or file a claim. <clears throat> so what were we to think of that? We never knew about it. It was Hadley versus Baxendale. It was all these cases and they were cocoons of thought where we parsed them and what was the legal reasoning and maybe someone would say something like, it wasn't fair uh, that was public policy. You don't want to, that, that was an intrusion into the pedagogy. You can't believe what the atmosphere was. Uh, the, the Socratic method, which is very good in some ways, but when it's taken to an extreme, it's a form of intellectual arrogance that was turned into a ped pedagogical tool. And it was intimidating when it was taken to extreme. When it was done by Warren Seavey of torts or Williston of contracts, it was a thing of beauty. But at times, it was very intimidating. And if you read that book, 1L, you could understand uh, what was meant. Now, is the law really a lie? Is the law a, a lie when you study it as it is on the statute books, but you don't study it as it plays out in the corridors and the arenas of raw power? And the law's mission is obviously to restrain, direct, channel, or eliminate raw, cruel, vicious power. And if the law has any meaning, 
it has to connect with justice and fairness. I know the complexity of the law stretches out uh, the sequence of that flow, and sometimes you never even get to talk about it. But without the law meaning justice and fairness, what does it mean? It means that it becomes an instrument of oppression itself, as a lot of poor people have seen in the criminal justice system. It means that as an instrument, it becomes just the opposite of what it should be. It becomes a form of concentrating more and more corporate power in fewer and fewer hands so that it begins to emerge as a maturing corporate state. That is exactly what Franklin Roosevelt said to the US Congress in 1938 when he recommended the establishment of a commission to study concentrated corporate power. He says, a rough paraphrase, quote, whenever government is controlled by private economic power, that is fascism, end quote. So the question we have to ask, and it's not a new one, but it has to be asked incessantly, is what are you being trained for and are you being educated? You're going to be trained here. The law school is very good at that. About being educated, that's another question. A lot of students do not take certain courses here because the subject is not asked on the bar exam. Rest assured, do not worry about the bar exam. It's eminently crammable in more than one sense. Okay? <laughs> do, do not pick your courses on the basis of that. They do a very good cram course job after you graduate, and you'll have, have very little trouble with it. So don't avoid taking jurisprudence or legal philosophy, or above all, legal history. There isn't a single professional school where the students should not take the history of the profession, whether it's accounting, medicine, economics, whatever. But once you do that, uh, you have a higher horizon. You begin asking yourself, what do I want to do with my professional life? You know, you've got 2,500, 3,000 uh, 3, weeks left, maybe 17, 18,000 days. Did last week go quickly? You haven't seen anything yet. Ask your parents and grandparents, right, how fast it goes. And what are you going to look back on? I remember interviewing a lawyer, a uh, corporate lawyer for our book, No Contest, which is in your library on corporate lawyers. And uh, I said, what, do, what have you been doing? Well, for almost 15 years, he was representing a company in New Jersey called Geritol, which is a drink, a drink. And it advertised itself as being good for, quote, tired blood. And, and the Federal Trade Commission went after them for deceptive advertising. And he spent the better of a dozen years sending his kids through college with that retainer. You want to look back on that? Do you want to look back with some lawyers now who are retired and they represented the, the carcinogen industry of our age, tobacco? Or they represented the broad form deed in Appalachia that uh, took poor Appalachian farmers for 50 cents an acre, all the minerals underneath with freedom to pollute the air and the water at will? because they were so desperately poor in the 20s and 30s? Would you be proud of representing that? Would you be proud of representing the corporate crooks in Wall Street? What is the purpose of the Harvard Law School? Well, you know who knows what the purpose is? The corporate giants. They know exactly what the purpose of the Harvard Law School is. It's to provide endless relays of lawyers who service their interests who justify not taking their conscience to work by saying they are required to zealously represent their clients. It's as if they're representing indigents, where if they didn't represent them, they wouldn't have representation. But I think you can agree that Goldman Sachs will always find lawyers to represent them. Harvard basically is not, Harvard Law is not an institution that provokes any kind of consternation or fear among the power structure, just the opposite. 
It's an institution, and I'll get around to the exceptions. Uh, on the whole, it's an institution that rationalizes corporate power brilliantly, services corporate power brilliantly with its, with its graduates and some of its departments here. It's an institution that invites corporate criminals and war criminals and gives them ovations at the law school, whether they were involved in the sociocide of Iraq or the military industrial com complex fraud that Eisenhower warns about as being a threat to our liberty in his farewell address, or whether they sank Wall Street with criminal and criminogenic behavior that almost destroyed our economy, unemploying eight million workers, shredding trillions of dollars of pensions, other people's money, Brandeis called them, and trillions of dollars of mutual funds, and then had the gall after they jumped ship with their golden severance pays of millions of dollars and sinking their own companies, Citigroup, Merrill Lynch, AIG, they had the gall to go to Washington for a taxpayer bailout that was anything but lawful. In fact, the former chief of Goldman Sachs, Mr. Paulson, who became Secretary of the Treasury at the time when George W. Bush wanted Wall Street uh, to bail out itself, was quoted in the Washington Post as saying about all the things he did, quote, I never had the authorities to do what I did, but somebody did, had to do it, end quote. And it didn't even ruffle the legal profession. You know what he was saying? That he was maneuvering trillions of dollars, often with secret deals on weekends, bailing out Citigroup, that he was violating the law, or he didn't have the authority to do what he did, and he did it anyway. And it didn't ruffle anybody in Washington in the legal profession, even though the admission was on page one of the Washington Post. I want to set a few quick pre predicates. Uh, but before I do, I want, to, I want to ask you to put yourself in the place of law students in the 50s and ask yourself, how would you have reacted, given what you know now? because most of us didn't react. We just took it. We assumed it. At law school, there was only one clinic. It was legal aid. How many do you have now? Plenty. There were no courses, as I said, on corporate crime, poverty law, consumer or environmental law, or a distinct civil rights course on women and minorities. And this was after Brown versus Board which came out in 1954. There, were, there was a distinct reluctance for these law students to question their professors. I assume that's not the case anymore. I'll give you an example. I think it might have been right here in Langdale South. Is that where we are? It was a constitutional law course. And the professor was uh, the ultimate, you. You. And he asked the question, why did the jury come in in this criminal case in a southern state the way it did? And so 11 hands went up. And he just, ridiculous. Did you sleep last night? Try again. I mean, he just, like that. And there was a guy in the back. And he had like three strikes against him. First of all, he was out of his seat assignment. Second of all, he had dungarees, all dressed up. And third, he had his foot on the back of one of the chairs. And, but he's the only guy who had a hand up at the end. And the professor said, you. And he said, well, professor, maybe the jury came in this way because it was all white. You could have heard a pin drop. People turned around, look at this pariah. Who's this pariah descending with this ridiculous public policy intervention? Now watch. It was only a few years later that the Supreme Court of the United States declared unconstitutional discriminatory jury selection. 
another example of how in those days you could never accuse Harvard Law School of foresight because, <laughs> simply because you couldn't footnote it. That's, that's the, that was the atmosphere. Now, it changed, right? Okay, so fast forward, you've got all kinds of clinical courses. You even have a semester course on corporate crime. You have a much broader curriculum, unbelievable number of seminars, couple dozen clinics, each one very tempting, each one uh, inviting your hands-on experience with the real clients under uh, supervision of your clinic uh, directors. And uh, how did all that happen? And what did it take to happen? It started with people getting beat up in the South. That's how it happened. It started with sheriffs and bloodhounds and prisons and all the things you know about in the civil rights movement. It started with people being drafted and sent to the war in Vietnam. Uh, it started with the early uh, latest stage women's rights, which were demonstrations, sit-ins. It started with four black engineering students who sat in on a a restaurant uh, where they weren't supposed to in North Carolina and took it all the way up for a unanimous decision, nine nothing on their behalf. And all that then morphed into some of the uh, uprisings in the city. Newark blew up, Detroit blew up. And finally, all this illuminated with returning students from summers in the South and elsewhere, it illuminated the conscience of the law school. It wasn't enough the intellect should do that. It was the fires in the, in the country. And then the students came back and they started making demands and the faculty, some of them joined them and the administration began to concede. It all started with the people out there that you're supposed to serve, but unlikely will. And it all started with the students, a handful. And if you actually added it up in terms of hours, in terms of people, you can come to the conclusion that it was a lot easier than we thought to make these changes at the law school because the real brunt of the burden in making them were those people out there who were being disrespected, excluded, unlawfully uh, imprisoned, underinsured, defrauded, and so on. That's a good lesson. The further predicate is you may not be discussing in three years the difference between an attorney and a lawyer. Have you ever had that discussion, 2L, 3L? Okay. An attorney, uh, that's something both of you, uh, it's a dual role for you. That is, once you get licensed, you have a role as an attorney to torn for your clients and your retainers, et cetera. But that's not your only, your only duty. Most of the courses at law schools train you to be an attorney, more or less. They don't educate you to be a lawyer. Being a lawyer means reflecting the overall concerns of injustice in the country. That's your duty. Why? Because as an attorney, number one, you have a monopoly. And number two, you are immediately designated once you're licensed as an officer of the court. And those entail obligations that have been ensconced into various professional canons of ethics. I'll read you a very short segment from the American Bar Association's Model Rules of Professional Conduct. Quote, listen very carefully here because it's ignored overwhelmingly by a million lawyers. Thank goodness for the handful who don't. Quote, a lawyer is a representative of clients, an officer of the legal system, and a public citizen having special responsibilities for the quality of justice. As a public citizen, a lawyer should seek improvement of the law, the administration of justice. A lawyer should be mindful of deficiencies in the administration of justice. End quote. How much content is there here for that? There's quite a bit in the clinical courses, but then they fall off a cliff because they don't provide you with the jobs, to use the 
conventional word, they don't provide you with enough public interest jobs. Any profession worth its salt should tithe itself so that at least 10% of the profession can deal with the professional's mission, not the making money mission. The mission of doctors is to prevent trauma and disease, and if they can't, then they minister them and make a living. And yet, the number of public interest lawyers in this country who work full time outside of legal services and not in the government, people like ACLU lawyers, uh, Natural Resources Defense Fund lawyers, NAACP lawyers, Sierra Club lawyers, take them all together. They are smaller in number than the number of lawyers who work for Cravat Swain, or who work for Baker and Botts, or for work for DLA Piper. Just think of that. And think of what they've accomplished. Think of what these few lawyers have accomplished in every area that concerns you. Think of what a handful of citizen groups, nonprofit advocacy groups, like, again, Sierra Club, or ACLU, or Hispanic Civil Rights Groups, or NAACP, or Public Citizen, or Common Cause, or People for the American Way. Put them all together, add up their budget. It's less than Steve Schwartzman, the head of Blackstone Investments, made two years ago. He made $640 million. One person. Not exactly, you know, doing the kind of work that one would elevate him to the horizon of justice. How many of you heard Senator Elizabeth Warren speak here? Are you here? You make sure you have her come back. She'll say things she didn't say when she was here. There are all kinds of taboos in all professions. We self-censure ourselves, and it's a matter of degree. There are certain things we don't like to talk about, certain topics that are taboo. And I'm not talking about politically incorrect here. I'm talking about things that upset the world view of a particular profession or a law school. And I'm going to run through a few of these. Not that they're entirely foreign to you, but just look, as we didn't adequately have a sensitivity in the 50s to the issues I talked about, what are we ad inadequately uh, attending to today? Uh, what's the version today? And to what extent is there a huge gap between your law school courses and the reality out there on the ground? Like you study international law. What's the reality on the ground? Systemic, massive violation of international law. Do you study that? Or do you study international law as it should be and as some cases have decided it is to be. All right, first we start with the destruction of freedom of contract. Fine print contracts are destroying your right of freedom of contract. That's hardly news. When you click on, you don't even read the contract before you buy the service, or you sign on the dotted line. What is news is that you're not in an uproar about it that you've accepted the cultural denial of a legal ideal, which is freedom of contract. You talk to conservatives, that's the big thing, freedom of contract. And your courses are overwhelmingly training you to deal with negotiated contracts between corporations, corporations of government, labor unions, corporations. That's where the money is. That's where the jobs are. And so in a rough survey of law schools, the course on contracts in most law schools devotes one, 
to two hours at the most to fine print contracts. The fine print contracts are far worse than they were in the 50s. So the contract professors are presiding over a disappearing subject matter for 99% of the people. The contracts now are cannibalizing tort law. When you sign these contracts and you agree to compulsory arbitration, or you agree to, to, to the total nullification, have you heard of this one? Unilateral modification. The vendor induces your consent in this torrent of fine print, another legal fiction, to say they can change the terms and you're bound by them. Like frequent flyer miles, to take a simple example, they can expand the number of miles and it doesn't matter, retroactively. Now this is why Professor Margaret Radin just came out a couple, three, four years ago, the book called Boilerplate, Michigan Law School. Brilliant analysis. And one of her conclusions was that fine print contracts are themselves a tort. Themselves a tort. It's a very erudite book, and I encourage you to read it. How about the non-enforceability of the laws? Who are we kidding here? You study fair housing laws, they're massively unenforced. You, st you, you study uh, consumer protection laws, massively un unenforced. You name it. Environmental laws, water pollution permits, you read about it in the New York Times, but it doesn't filter in to the classes. There should be courses called illegality. Just illegality, non-enforcement of the law. So you have to face it. A few hundred yards away is Malcolm Sparrow, professor at Kennedy School of Government. Anybody hear of him? Now watch our culture. Watch, watch our culture. Anybody hear, uh, uh, anybody hear, hear of George Clooney? <laughs> okay. How about uh, Taylor, what's her name? Swift. <laughs> Taylor Swift? Okay? All right, watch. He, he's got a little expertise. He is the nation's expert. He's an applied mathematician. He's the nation's expert on computerized billing fraud and abuse in the healthcare industry. His minimal estimate, minimal, is $300 billion a year. 10% of all that's spended. Minimal. Never discussed in elections, never discussed in Congress hardly. He's testified once in a while. And they thank him and packs his bags and he comes back to Cambridge. You should invite him here. You should invite him here so he can tell you why the country doesn't seem to be upset about it. Because people don't feel it, third party payment, et cetera, Medicare, fraud on the Medicare. But it's just another example. I mean, it's like fishing off the Grand Banks of Newfoundland in 1700. It's all over. It's rampant non-enforcement of the laws. We're not talking about nuanced prosecutorial discretion due to min minimal budgets. That's bad enough. Ask yourself, there are three branches of government in the states. What do you think the court budget is for, for the judiciary? It's less than 2%. Why are we rationing justice? You remember Learned Hand's dicta on that? If, if you have a democracy, thou shalt not ration justice. So I can go into more illustrations, but we're running short on time. But I do want to point one out that's very close to law school. And that is the outlaw nature of the modern presidency. The presidency now, in the so-called war on terror, the president can be judge, jury. The president can be prosecutor, judge, jury, and executioner, all in secret. This should really disturb the Harvard Law School, since the president now is a graduate of the Harvard Law School. Former president of the Law Review. Law Review could be less interested in this. There's a lot of documentation that the violation of Constitution, federal statutes, Geneva Convention, it's not episodic, it's systemic, it's daily. The New York Times wrote an article called Killer Tuesday when the president is surrounded in the White House with his 
security advisors and they decide who they're going to kill three, four, five thousand miles away, including signature strikes, places like Yemen. A uh, bunch of young men, they don't know their names, they're just huddled together uh, and they're considered suspects and they're evaporated. Signature strikes. Not a ripple in the law schools, except there are a few stray law professors here and there who are very concerned about it. Well, let me, let me put it all in a bundle for you. Should we be concerned about the following? Secret laws, secret evidence, secret courts, secret prisons, secret wars, secret torture, secret unauditable expenditures, redacted published judicial opinions. Imagine that. Redacted published judicial opinions arbitrary state secrets defense against judicial recourse, routine violations of due process, probable cause, habeas corpus. That should be everybody's business, no matter what their specialty is, if they are a member of the legal profession. We should not be allowed to escape ourselves from what's going on in this country. When we were at law school, we were worried about Joe McCarthy and his intimidations, his slander, his red baiting, that was the big thing. Joe McCarthy, by comparison with what's going on today in your country, was a miserable sideshow by comparison. Look at Guantanamo. Look at our prisons. Look at our solitary confinements. I look out at the students here, and I'm saying in the back of my mind, what a wonderful diversity. You have women, men, minorities, not as many as you would like, but compared to the 50s. What's the value of that other than equal opportunity for an upwardly mobile career defined by male standards? You go into the corporate law firms defined by male standards. You go to the Department of State defined by male standards before women and minorities ever got in there. What's the point? What do you bring to the profession, to the country, to the world, because you're part of a breakthrough diversity core? What do you bring to it? Well, you might bring more sensitivity to certain women's issues, reproductive rights, daycare, but in the all-encompassing corporate domination of our society, all-important deterioration of our democracy. We all have to put another burden on our back if we're from, we were from excluded groups so we can tutor the dominant groups. There's always a rationalization. Oh, it's not my specialty. Uh, I'm not into presidential powers. I just deal with bankruptcy. <laughs> well, you know, Dean Aaron Grizzle was a tax lawyer here. He was a tax professor. And he was one of the first deans, and you can't believe the courage this took, to publicly challenge Senator Joe McCarthy. He didn't say, oh, I'm a tax lawyer. I've just got to deal with tax issues. Watch for those easy rationalizations. The key point is that if the law school does not reinvent itself, if does not split into two curriculums, one, the normal servicing of the commercial economy, you want to do that, fine. And the other, servicing civic values, servicing justice, servicing fairness, servicing shift of power, servicing modes of organization of the citizenry, servicing electoral reform. That's what needs to be done. We need thousands of lawyers who do this as lawyers, who take their conscience to work, and who begin to reshape power. Otherwise, all you're going to see in the coming 50 years is a few breakthroughs here and there, but by and large, the drift of global corporatism is concentrated power defined by commercial standards and values running roughshod over the far more important civic and spiritual values that spell a civilized society and a world. Every major religion warned its adherents not to give too much power to the merchant class. What did they know? Was it something conveyed to them from on high? 
or was it reflecting common experience that the monomaniacal driven motivation of the profit instinct brooks no challengers in its mission for ag ag aggregating profits. It will diminish, control, co-opt, or destroy other value systems that are nowhere near as well organized. That's why every major religion issued those warnings. So what, what would I have Harvard Law School do once they break into these two curriculums, once they redefine their mission, which is justice? What would we have them do? We would fill the courses, all of them, with empirical reality. The courses are heavily empirically starved. That's not true for your clinics. It's not true for some of your courses. It's not going to be true for Professor John Hansen's course on systemic justice and the Justice Lab, something you should pay a lot of attention to. It's probably not true for Lucian Bebchek's uh, courses on corporate governance. It's probably not true for Roberta Unger on building democratic societies or the omnipresent Lawrence Lessig uh, on campaign finance reform. But by and large, the courses are not reflecting what's going on back on the ground. The second thing that Harvard Law School should do is redirect massive resources into justice, either by its leverage, prestige all over the country with alumni, as well as with foundations and other sources of money. You know, you have nanotechnology coming, biotechnology coming, artificial intelligence coming. They have no framework, no legal and moral framework. No legal and moral framework. When Bill Joy of Sun Microset wrote his fabulous article in Wired Magazine in 2000, the title was, The Future Doesn't Need Us. And what he meant was that unless we bring under control whatever, we may disagree how artificial intelligence, biotech, and nanotech, the future is not going to need us because they're the future autonomously. Now, the Harvard Law School class of 1958, our class, got together at one reunion and said, why don't we do something other than talk about our practice? And most of them were corporate lawyers. I felt a little lonely. But we knew each other when we were law students. There was a cohesion there, a familiarity. And we started the Appleseed Foundation. And we funded it. It now has started 16 centers for law and justice all over the country. That's one law school class. By the way, it was not exactly encouraged to talk with other alumni reunions by Dean Clark when he was in charge of the law school. But now I guess they have good access. Now what if other law school classes did that? What if Harvard took it to dozens and dozens of law schools and said 30 years and out, 35 years and out, you're going to start looking to move from success to significance, to quote a felicitous phrase by one of the alumnus. You would have thousands of jobs that would be recruiting here and other law schools in public interest advocacy. I'll give you an example. You've heard Warren Buffett say that he's undertaxed, that his secretary's taxed more at a higher rate than he is. There are about a dozen enlightened multi-billionaires and billionaires who are appalled by the tax law and its grotesque provisions and its perverse incentives and its lack of fairness, and its tax havens, and all the rest. What if Harvard Law School invited these billionaires to a round table and basically showed that all this brain power on tax reform, which never went anywhere in terms of change, is available <coughs> if they would put in, over three years, a billion dollars to organize every congressional district meticulously swarm Congress with tax reform advocates and have a national media campaign. Stanley Surrey was a tax professor here years ago 
and he went into Kennedy administration. He had tax reform. They got a little bit. But by and large, nothing has occurred since. It's gotten worse and worse. Our, uh, our generation has an obligation to provide you with public interest positions. It's not enough just to talk. We have to build the institutions. We have an underdeveloped democracy and an overdeveloped plutocracy and oligarchy. We have got to mobilize ourselves. We have to exhort ourselves, especially you, to higher levels of significance. Do not minimize yourself and sell your talents to go to work on lucrative trivia or destructive retainers. Do not do that. Under any circumstance, you'll feel rotten about it. You'll be in your 30s and 40s, and you'll hate your work, even though the monthly check is very nice. Now, let me just end with an exhortation. I know what I'm talking about, about the potential of Harvard Law students. Many of our groups were run and staffed by Harvard Law students. We used the legislative research drafting group here, which doesn't exist anymore, right? Do you have legislative drafting? They drafted some of our laws, which we got enacted. Major checkoffs for consumer protection against utility companies. They did an excellent job. A lot of us on the hustings in Washington don't have quite the patience that law students do to develop very, very refined statutory language that anticipates and foresees and forestalls as well as enables. So let me end with these words. My expressions are conveyed as an invitation for collaborative introspection by you and your faculty. And you have some very good faculty for that purpose. Look forward. Be your own starry decisis. Start your own revolutionary traditions. In the spirit of Thomas Jefferson, who suggested that maybe there should be a revolution every 15 years for unresponsive governments. I don't think he was talking about violent, but you know what he was talking about. Supplant your campus small talk with big talk. There's nothing more irritating to some of our generation than to walk through law school campuses and never be able to look at a law, school, law student in the eye because they're all like this. This is devouring you. Think of the implications of looking at screens and endless text messages that have minimal gravity. Think of the implications, hour after hour. Look up from your stupid smartphones and see the horizons before you. Experience the life of joy and justice. Avoid like the plague, the plague of minding yourself in rigid routines daily that draw even tighter circles around you. Start a visiting victims program in your classes. Have them sprinkled through your class, three or four out of 80, visiting for a few days. Absorb their reactions from their very different perspectives. What would happen in your labor law class or in your civil rights class or in your consumer classes if you had in your course, in the classroom, visiting injured workers, migrant workers, defrauded debtors, malpractice patients, excluded investors, child custody nightmares, falsely convicted inmates, refugees from America's empire, dissenters jailed without charges, people in solitary confinement, farmers driven to the wall by oligopolies, homeowners underwater due to Wall Street crimes, pensioners fleeced by their employers, punished whistleblowers from giant cor corporate law firms and national security agencies. They're all willing to come. And we're not talking about anecdotal phenomena here. We're talking about refugees from systematic patterns of injustice. You can add your own list. A visiting victor victims program.
program. Leave Harvard Law School very different than when you entered it. Take the Harvard Law parallel to the Athenian oath of citizenship. In these Periclean Athens, they took the oath to leave Athens better off than they entered it. To know and not to do is not to know. That came out of the 14th century philosopher in the Ming Dynasty. Just think of that. To know and not to do is not to know. On the other side of the world, Marcus Cicero gave us what I think is the best definition of freedom. He wrote, freedom is participation in power. How many times do you hear that context? How long is it going to take for us to catch up with Cicero and this Chinese philosopher? How can you, chosen to journey through this high citadel called Harvard Law School, from among the thousands of applicants who were rejected, not have a higher estimate of your significance, soaring beyond the, ce the ce ceiling and the selling of your talents for lucrative trivia or worse. In the coming days, a book collection of wise and experienced recent submissions to the Harvard Law Record will be available in print. In print by Jove. Imagine for you to digest. In the coming school year, the record wishes to be your vibrant forum for going valiantly where few law students have gone before. Connect with the students there. Write for it. Stand on the shoulders of your mo most illustrious forebears, your courageous forebears, who changed what I described in the 50s. So much for the better. Catapult from stagnant silos or corrosive cocoons into making the improbable here possible. The lawyers of this country and the people of this country need you. We're not engaging in exhortation and generational flattery. We need you. We need your ideal idealism. You may not know it, but the legal profession often looks at students at law school as their conscience, having no ax to grind. They can tell it the way it is. The sum and substance of legal education and its ultimate intellectual challenge has got to be the realization of legal systems furthering justice and fairness for all. Back to Robert Hutchins. What is the purpose of the Harvard Law School? If you like some of these remarks and they generate some discussion in the coming days, I suggest you establish an ad hoc committee titled the Harvard Law Students Committee to establish, excuse me, to establish a committee of inquiry and resolve. That's a nice phrase, I think. The Harvard Law Students Committee of Inquiry and Resolve. So you can continue these explorations. Harvard Law School is mimicked by other law schools, for better or worse. Make sure that whatever you do here that breaks new ground travels throughout the law school community and beyond after graduation. Thank you very much.